Welcome, my friends, to the most ambitious Wood Whisperer Guild project to date, the Benchcrafted Split Top Rubo Workbench. Now, I hope you build along, but if you don't, don't worry about it, because there are going to be a lot of details, uh, techniques, ways of dealing with large timbers, large mortises and tenons. Uh, there's a lot of things going on with this project that you can then apply to other projects, even if you're perfectly happy with your workbench or you're just not ready to build one yet. Uh, but I have to warn you, if you are gonna build along, you're gonna put some blood, sweat, and tears into this project. You know, and frankly, I think that's the way it should be. Your workbench is kind of your, your partner in the workshop, I and mean, a lot of us work alone, but your workbench is an extension of you as a woodworker, and it should be something that works into your workflow uh, and is not a hindrance. It's something that should help your processes in the shop, and that's exactly why we're building this uh, design, which I think is uh, fairly well proven to be applicable to all different levels of woodworker, different types of woodworker. Overall, I just think it's a, a really solid design. Now, we can't really talk about workbenches without jumping into the first and most frequently asked question, and that is, what wood species should I use? Now, we're going to simplify things as much as possible here because, I mean, just look behind me. There's tons of different species of wood, and I only have a few represented on my rack here. Uh, you could use so many different things, and there is no one right answer. So we have to keep things as simple as possible. Let's first talk about price. Price is one of those things that varies dramatically by region. And the other sort of X factor here is your budget. I don't know what your budget is, you know, how much money you want to put into this bench. So you may want to spend a lot of money, you may not. So that's something that's kind of a personal decision. You really need to think about how much you want to uh, throw down in here, and whether this is the project where you want to be tight with your money. This is a lifelong workbench, so maybe throwing a few extra bucks to get a better quality wood is not a bad idea. Now, the second uh, factor we'll talk about is wood hardness. This one deals more with functionality. The way the bench behaves, the way work interacts with the workbench can vary dramatically based on uh, you know, the hardness of the wood. And then of course also how well the wood works. If you're dealing with these large timbers, the bigger, denser, and heavier they are, the harder it's gonna to be to work them. So uh, that's another factor that we should discuss. And in fact, I have a few examples here on the assembly table. Let's take a look and we'll discuss their hardness and how that might relate to how you would use it in the shop. When talking about hardness, there actually is a low-tech test that you can do to determine how hard the board is. You just pick it up, you squeeze it. I mean, this is a technique I think was developed in the 80s. It's called the Charmin test. All right, I think I really, really dated myself with that horrible joke. Uh, but at least I didn't say that it's an ancient Chinese secret. Now, there actually is a bit of a low-tech way that you can do this. If you take your fingernail and you just push it into the wood fibers, you can feel a significant difference between, let's say, something like Douglas fir and this piece of babinga, right? So it's a very obvious difference, but you can't get real fine results in, in comparing two woods that are very close together. For that, we thankfully have a scale that we can refer to. It's called the Jenka scale. Now, the Jenka hardness test involves taking a steel ball, they put it on the surface, and they measure how much force it takes to embed it into the surface. And the number that they spit out, basically, is on a relative scale where you can see where the particular species you're looking at, where it falls in that scale in terms of hardness. So, what I have here are a few examples that sort of go across the spectrum. Let's start over here with the softest wood. Here I have a piece of pine, and frankly I don't know exactly which type of pine it is, but it's one of the softer uh, variations at 380 to 400 on the Jenka scale. Now keep in mind, not all pine is created equal. If you're on the East Coast, you probably have access to Southern Yellow Pine. Southern Yellow Pine is a little bit harder, well quite a bit harder, at 870 on the Jenka scale. So that's something to keep in mind. I would not use this you know, standard pine, the softer pines, on a workbench though, I just think it's a little bit too soft. Now moving up a little bit, this is a piece of poplar. Stuff is widely available, fairly inexpensive, and it's a 540 on the Jenka scale. Moving up from there, I have a piece of alder. Alder is 590 on the Jenka scale, also a fairly inexpensive wood. Now here I've got a 4x4 post of Douglas fir. Douglas fir comes in at 660 on the Jenka hardness scale, and frankly, we're starting to get into a range that I feel comfortable recommending for a workbench. The thing is with Douglas fir, though, I find it to be fairly unstable, especially if you get the varieties at the home stores. That construction grade lumber tends to be wet, it tends to dry and crack. I mean, even this post has some really nice cracks in it already. 
So if you're going to use something like Douglas fir, I recommend getting it from a good quality hardwood dealer and hopefully that source material will be a little bit better than the construction grade stuff that you can get at the home centers. I do know some guild members who have workbenches made of Douglas fir and they absolutely love them. Next up we've got maple. What I have here is a soft maple board that comes in at 950 on the Jenka hardness scale and this is hard maple. That's 1450 on the Jenko hardness scale. So soft maple and hard maple, although they look very similar, there actually is a significant difference in hardness. And here we have a monster slab of Babinga. These tropical exotics are incredibly dense, very hard to work, especially if you're a hand tool woodworker. 1980 on the Jenko hardness scale. And you can hear there's even more of a tonality to this wood. Uh, because it's just so dense. So frankly, this is way off the scale. This is not what I would consider an ideal material for a workbench. It sure would look cool, uh, but you are going to have a heck of a time moving these boards around, milling them to size, and getting this bench together if you tried to make it. Uh, not to mention you'd probably max out your credit cards. So with all of these species to choose from, how is a woodworker supposed to pick the perfect species for their workbench? Well, first of all, get it out of your head that there's a perfect species. The bottom line is there's a range of species that will probably work for the type of work that you do. You just have to find where you lie on that scale and what your personal opinion is on which wood is ideal or which range of woods are ideal for your workbench. Now, I think most of us can knock the extremes off of the potential list. Like for instance, if you used Babinga to make a workbench, number one, you'd be a little bit crazy, but if you did, Let's say you're working with a project that's made out of pine and you accidentally drop your project material on the corner of your workbench. The end result is a pretty nice dent. Uh, your workbench is fine, there's no dent in there. I mean, this thing is like a piece of steel. But of course, any of these other woods are going to dent pretty substantially when they make contact. So you really don't want the bench to be super hard. So we can knock that off of our list of options. On the other side of things, I don't really want my bench to be too soft either, and part of that is I don't want to have to constantly plane this surface down and clean it up all the time. I expect my, my bench to get dented and scratched and have drill holes in it and, and whatnot. That's just what a workbench is for. But I don't want to make it so susceptible to that stuff that it becomes an eyesore. So the softer woods, you know, things like this pine board, I think are just a little bit too soft. And I do work with a lot of hardwoods and exotics. So for me personally, this would wind up getting dented like crazy. So that's really not an option for me. And in fact, for me personally, I consider uh, the poplar and the alder pretty much lumping them into that same family. They're a little bit too soft. Now we have our Douglas fir, the soft maple, and the hard maple. The hard maple, you know, at 1450, it's pretty hard and pretty, you know, difficult to plane. So when you're actually trying to plane the top of your bench, you may have some issues with this. It's going to take a lot of elbow grease. So at 1450, I think that's a little bit too hard for me personally. In this area, and I would say this is basically between, you know, Douglas fir at 660 and the soft maple at 950. To me, that's what I think is sort of the ideal range. Now there are things that are a little bit harder here somewhere between the hard maple and the soft maple. Those are perfectly fine to use. But I think if we're looking at the sweet spot, soft maple is really the way that I think most people would be satisfied with. Um, Benchcrafted actually agrees with me on this and they think that soft maple is an ideal choice for a workbench. So that's gonna be my personal recommendation and that's what I'm gonna use. So let's take a look at my wood pile because I actually do have it on hand already and we'll see what we're up against here. So under my butt here is about 150 board feet of soft maple. My supplier charges about $3.29 a board foot for it, so that's pretty darn good. And this is the perfect place for us to talk about your buying strategy because there's really more than one way that you could tackle this. Number one, the total board foot count you could go anywhere between 150 and 200. Benchcrafted suggests that you kind of go more toward 200 so that you have extra, you don't have to make repeat trips, and you can also make sure that you're using the best boards for your bench, and especially for the top, it's really where you want the best stuff. So 200 gives you those options, 150 cuts it a little bit closer. The one thing you have to consider is depending on what is available to you, you may have to overbuy considerably. Let's say you can only get 12 foot boards or 10 foot boards, the problem is you really only need eight feet to make this bench as far as the pieces for the top. Now, if you have a 12 footer, you can certainly use that cutoff piece. After you cut your eight foot segment out, you now have a four foot segment that you can use for other parts of the bench. 
If you have a 10 footer, it's only gonna leave you with about two feet. So that may not be able to be incorporated into other parts of the bench, which means you're overbuying and you're gonna have a lot left over. The same thing goes for the width. Ideally, you want your boards to be either five inches or a little bit over. And if you have wider boards, you want them to be somewhere between nine and 10 inches, preferably more toward the 10, because we're gonna to have to split this down the middle to get two pieces out of it. And of course, when you split these big long boards, they tend to warp and we need some extra material to mill this so it's nice and uh, true and straight. The thing is, if you, okay, this one's five, let's say you bought one that is about between seven and eight inches. The problem is that's not enough to get two pieces out of it. So when you take your four and a half, five inch piece off of this, you're gonna be left with two or three inches of material that's just wasted. I mean, you might be able to use them in another project, but as far as it pertains to this project, all of that board footage is just gone to waste. So that's why you have to keep in mind, depending on the size of the boards you have access to, you may need to go closer to the 200 board foot count just to make sure that you have enough. Now let's take a moment to talk about lumber thickness. If you look at the cut list, you'll see that we recommend four quarter, eight quarter, and 12 quarter. Now the four quarter and eight quarter, you should have no problem finding in just about any species you're looking for. The 12 quarter, on the other hand, it's a little bit of a different story. Not everybody carries 12 quarter, and if they do, they may not have the species you're looking for. Furthermore, when you go to buy 12 quarter, chances are they're gonna want you to buy the whole board. That means eight foot or 12 feet of 12 quarter stock. That's that's a lot of money, that's a lot of waste, and you don't really need it. So I would probably recommend the most economical choice is just to take a couple pieces of eight quarter and glue those puppies together and you'll get the thickness that you need. No one will notice the difference, it's not a big deal, um, but we put the 12 quarter there just in case you do have access to it. It really is the ideal choice, but it's not necessarily the most economical choice, so just keep that in mind. So what's the first step in building this workbench? Well, to get the old bench out of the way. I sort of made a promise to myself that if I was gonna do this, I was gonna do it right, and I wanted to show you how to build a workbench when you don't already have a workbench in place. It really changes things, so <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Wish me luck, but for now, I gotta get this thing out of here. I think I'm gonna regret this. Ah, crap, the door's that way. So no more workbench, just a big open space. So I think I'm probably gonna need to get myself a couple of saw horses, uh, that would be handy. I may even wind up working on the concrete floor. I mean, that may just be the easiest thing to do initially. Now, when you do something like this, you really need to think strategically about what you build first, because essentially we have two main parts of the build, the base and the top. Now, if you build the base first, and in fact, I think Benchcrafted recommends that you build the base first, you have a nice sturdy platform on which you can actually support the top when you're building the top. But I think about it a little bit differently. For me personally, I like the idea of doing the top first because then I could just use some saw horses to support it. And as soon as my top slabs are together, I actually now have a work surface that I could use for chiseling, for sawing. I might even have a clamp installed that I could then use to hold the work pieces as we build the base. And the base pieces are much smaller. They're not nearly as big as the top pieces on those top slabs. Furthermore, there is a step later on down the line where everything has to be flipped upside down anyway. The whole base needs to come upside down to the underside of the top so we can scribe those tenons and locate the mortises that we're gonna have in the underside of our top. So ultimately, it just seems to make more sense to me to build the top first. A lot of people may wanna do something differently. This is just the order that I'm gonna do it in. I think it makes the most sense. So regardless of what you do, let me know. I'm curious how it works out for you, but this is the way I'm jumping in head first. We'll see how it goes. Uh, so wish me luck. This should be very interesting. And next time we're gonna talk about milling the lumber and come up with some strategies for dealing with these massive, massive boards. Thanks for watching.